Imagine your neighbor fished all the fish in your pond, or he discards your, his garbage on your lawn. You wouldn't like it, right? You would call the police, and maybe you would take your neighbor to court to have him fined. How about an industrial trawler going out to sea, fishing all the fish until the fish stock is entirely depleted? How about a vessel going out to the ocean, dumping hazardous waste into the ocean? What do we do? We don't like it either. But do we go and call the police? Can we take that person or another state to court? Is there a court to sanction this behavior? Answers will largely depend upon where the incident happened. It will depend upon whether uh, it happened close to the coast or far off on the high seas. In the latter case, on the high seas, the answer may well be that there is no court, that there is no police, that we cannot sanction this behavior, although clearly we don't like it. In the next uh, chapter, I will explain how the oceans are regulated from an international law perspective, what may be uh, effective regulation of the oceans, what makes it so difficult, and why even the enforcement of existing standards is a challenge. Let's remind us that the ocean is something not very distant or apart from us. Our lives depend upon the ocean in many ways, and the ocean depends upon our decisions for the sustainable uh, uh, use and protection. In the words of Kofi Annan, at that time UN Secretary General, he said, for too long, the world acted as if the oceans were somehow a realm apart, as areas owned by no one, free for all, with little need for care or management. The Law of the Sea Convention and other landmark legal instruments have brought important progress over the past two decades in protecting fisheries and marine ecosystems. But this common heritage of all humankind continues to face profound pressures. In a globalized world, pressures on the ocean increases as we have a variety of legitimate interests to accommodate. So it's not only about prohibiting activities. So what we need is we need to find a balance and we need to find international consensus on how this balance is going to look like to achieve our sustainable use and protection of marine uh, resources and to prevent a rise for the exploitation for resources on a first come first served basis. Issues of ocean governance include the regulation of marine resources such as fish, oil, gas, polymetallic nodules, but also energy generation from the seas, the prevention of pollution, and the conservation of biological diversity. These are framed in a variety of binding and non-binding instruments to change behavior and to contribute to sustainable governance of the ocean. So how the oceans are actually governed depends upon the objectives, the policymakers and stakeholders set on different levels and the ways they find to implement these and ultimate enforce compliance. Ultimately, though, it's us. It's you and it's me through politicians on the national and international level, but also us uh, who use the oceans as tourists, as fishermen, as um, captains of large vessels. And we decide what state we want the oceans to be in. And then we provide for the relevant governance structures and comply with rules and regulations if it goes well. This, in turn, uh, of course, depends upon our knowledge on the oceans. If we don't know what the state of the marine environment is, and we can't, we can't uh, decide what the state of the marine environment should do, we have, nothing, uh, we have no room for regulation, for informed decision making, for prudent and sustainable decision making. So we depend upon marine scientific research, on the facts, on the increasing knowledge, and then the decision makers on the governance level have to decide how to bring our different colliding interests uh, into um, to accommodate these different interests. International law is an important element of ocean governance, with the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea as the main general instrument to which more than 160 states are members. So that's a lot. That's almost all states in the world that have become members to this convention. Understanding how international law functions and how it addresses different challenges associated with the uh, use and protection of the ocean is important. For the purpose of effective governance, it would be best to view the ocean as a whole and to set common standards for all the connected waters. 
which are then binding standards which are binding and enforceable for all users in all parts of the world. Instead, international law establishes different maritime zones in which states have different rights and duties. States enjoy sovereignty or sovereign rights in some of these zones, while the high seas and the deep seabed are areas beyond national jurisdiction. And you can imagine they are more difficult to govern. So in the end, it depends upon the relevant zone, whether it is the police of a coastal state, we go back to our example, who can arrest a vessel found in breach of the law. So the vessel dumping hazardous wastes close to a coast can be held and arrested by the coastal police. Whereas on the high seas, if we meet a ship on the high seas, the ship in most cases can only be reported to the state whose flag it is flying for further sanctions. And they may or may not happen. It, then it depends upon some other state. There's no world police. And some flags of some states are known as so-called flags of convenience because environmental or labor standards are low or are not well enforced. In 1982, states decided in the Law of the Sea Convention to divide the oceans into different zones and to fix that zones, to make it very clear that you can only have 12 nautical miles territorial sea and not more. And then we have the exclusive economic zone in which the coastal state has um, exclusive rights over fisheries. And then the high seas, which are a global commons, and we will get back to that. In principle, global commons, as the name indicates, are open to the use of everybody. A vessel illegally polluting the internal waters or territorial sea of a state can be arrested by the coastal state's police, and the responsible person will be challenged in a national court. The same applies to a foreign trawler in the exclusive economic zone who fishes without a license or in excess of the license. Now, it might sound very clear and easy on paper, so the division of the ocean in different parts to clarify our regulation is, of course, much more difficult in reality. Fish, for example, are very unconcerned with artificial man-made boundaries in the ocean. They don't care whether they are in the territorial sea or the exclusive economic zone on the high seas, although their regulation, their management, for the management makes a huge difference. Um, so fish stocks straddle between uh, zones, and as a result, national standards for sustainable fisheries and coastal waters can be ineffective. Because you can have very good regulations in place for your waters, but then the fish stock goes out and goes to your neighbor where it's fished excessively and eventually is depleted. Governing the global commons beyond national jurisdiction is a particular challenge because the first come, first serve principle will apply. If there are no enforceable standards upon which states have agreed. We have uh, the fundamental uh, uh, difficulty is that we don't have the one institution that regulates all with binding law, not even the United Nations. The freedom to fish on the high seas is guaranteed to all states, so not only to coastal states, also to landlocked states like Armenia, Bolivia, Hungary, or Zambia. So these states have an equal right to fish on the high seas. It doesn't mean that fisheries are unregulated, but it's their protection uh, on the high seas and the sustainable use are much more difficult to set. Standards are more difficult to set and more difficult to enforce compared to areas under national jurisdiction where we have the police. Those who make the rules, states, are also those who have the economic interest and those who must enforce the rules. So we have very different than in the national legal system, uh, the lawmakers are at the same time the addressees of the regulation. And so they have an interest, they have an interest in preaching uh, the law, an economic interest. The deep sea and the high seas have in common that they are areas beyond national jurisdiction of a single state, yet the high seas and the deep seabed are administered very differently. The mineral resources of the deep seabed are governed by the International Seabed Authority with regulations and procedures on access, exploitation, uh, and uh, first exploration and then eventually exploitation. So here we have uh, an international regime that no longer focuses on open access, but on restrictions and licenses. There are currently no plans or effort to have an institution or comparable processes for the high seas, for fish. So there are no plans to have the international fisheries uh, uh, authority that gives quotas to 
all the um, more than 190 states of the world. And that would be very difficult. You've now heard quite a lot about international governance and uh, global commons. To summarize this chapter, we've learned that international law is an important element of ocean governance. The ocean is divided into zones in which states have different degrees of sovereignty and exclusive rights. Treating the ocean as a common good for humanity has led to the tragedy of the commons with maximal and unsustainable exploitation. In the end, the states must cooperate and strong international institutions to address the sustainable use of the oceans in areas beyond jurisdiction. They must implement international standards into their national legal orders and enforce them against their vessels. But if states breach international law, there are no automatic sanctions or court proceedings.